thanks everybody for those who could make it. This is uh, our third in the LTR, SBC LTR spring sem or seminar series, winter seminar series. It feels like spring already. Um, and we're going a little out of order now. We started with theme one, and now we're, we're jumping ahead to theme three uh, because of everybody's schedules and stuff. Um, and we are, by the way, recording to this seminar. So those of you who couldn't make it, uh, if, if you know people who couldn't make it that don't know, we'll, we'll send out the recording or put it on the website. I need to figure that out, but I'll send out a message about that after the, after the talk. So today, Kyle Cavanaugh and Tom Bell are gonna be talking about theme 3A, demographic connectivity and metapopulation dynamics of giant kelp. And so I'll turn it over to Kyle to start. All right, can you um, give me permission, uh, access to the screen sharing? Oh yes, sorry. Why does it always change these damn buttons? Well, it's not giving me the right button, so I'm just changing you to the host. That works too. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So is this is this showing the uh, the normal slide, not the notes view? It is. Yep. Okay. Cool. So so I'm I'm actually not going to talk about metapopulation dynamics and and connectivity per se. Most of most of this talk is going to be focused on methods and new data sets that we're planning in the in, in you know as, as a next step to investigate these small scale patterns of extinction recolonization synchrony to get at get at the inf influence of small scale connectivity um so this is largely a methods methods and kind of data set talk i want to acknowledge my grad student kate cavanaugh who really led all of the work that i'm going to present present today in fact she should probably be giving this talk and, and you know, maybe I'll, I'll get her to give, give the next one. Um, just a word on what is motivating, motivating this work. This is a, um, one, of the, one of the key figures from, from our proposal, some of Max's work showing that connectivity influences colonization and, and extinction. So the left-hand panel shows that more connected patches and larger patches are more likely to be recolonized after, after they go locally extinct. Um, the right-hand panel shows that, that larger patches and more connected patches are less likely to go extinct in, in the first, first place. And one of, the, one of the interesting findings here, you know, especially on the extinction panel to the right, is that that effect of connectivity seems to be greater for small patches. So, so the, the importance of connectivity in keeping a patch from going extinct is, is even more pronounced for those small patches. And so what we wanted to do with this, this round of funding is, is to dig in a little more to that small scale patterns of, of extinction and recolonization. What's, what's driving this greater impact on smaller, smaller patches? Um, that analysis that I just, just described utilized some um, connectivity modeling along with our Landsat kelp data set, which has, been, which has been wonderful. It's been useful for a variety of applications. But it has some, some important limitations, um, particular to this, this connectivity work. For, for one, there's a detection floor, right? Landsat is 30 meter resolution. And so it has problems detecting small, smart, sparse patches of, of kelp. And so as a result, it may misidentify true extinctions, right? If you have a small patch that has you know, very sparse kelp canopy that, that isn't detected on Landsat, we may think that that patch is extinct, whereas um, functionally, it still has still has kelp. Similarly, we can't see below the surface, and so we may have a loss of canopy, but but individuals individuals uh, below the surface of the water. So it again may not be be extinct. Um, it may miss small sparse patches that that are potentially important spore sources for recolonization. So if you look at the top right hand panel, this is a sparse shallow bed close to shore that would not be detected by Landsat, but you know, 
feasibly could be important for recolonization, recolonizing empty habitat nearby. Um, and then there's the limited ability to examine intra-patch dynamics. And so, you know, as part of this research, we want to look at the, the role of connectivity on demographics on scales of tens to hundreds of meters and landsets. Not, not, not going to cut it for that. And so I, I want to present two higher resolution data, kelp canopy data sets that we've, that we've created. One is using planet satellite imagery. This is three meter resolution, so an order of magnitude better. It's a commercial satellite program that provides multi-spectral data. So similar spectral data to Landsat. The, it, it provides daily imagery, which is, which is really incredible. And the way that they do this is that they've launched a constellation of inexpensive um, satellites with short lifespans. One, one result of this is that the radiometric quality is, is much poor as compared to like a large flagship NASA satellite. Um, and then there's drone imagery, which, which we, Tom, talked a little bit about how we're using this to monitor the LTR core sites. This has, can get centimeter resolution and uh, we have control over the temporal resolution because we're and, and coverage because we're actually going there and, and collecting the data. Um, so again, I, I mentioned I'll talk mostly methods today. One challenge with using both planet and, and UAVs is much smaller footprints. So each image covers a much smaller area. And so this leads to really a data management and processing problem. Um, for example, planet provides global coverage, but it requires stitching together lots and lots and lots of imagery if we want to cover, you know, the Santa Barbara Channel or Southern California or, or, or California. And so we really need a fully automated process for, for extracting kelp canopy from the, the data, um, right? Having a semi-automated process is, is not going to be good enough. And then UAVs, the, you know, these are really mostly useful, I think, for site level, site level an analysis, um, just because of the, the costs required to collect the imagery itself. Um, but again, you know, we're, we're collecting lots of UAV imagery. Again, we want a, a fully automated process for, for pulling the kelp canopy data from that. And that's what I'll start, start with. I'll start by describing Kate's automated method for mapping kelp canopy from UAV in, imagery. This study was just published a couple of weeks ago in Frontiers in Marine Science. And there's, there's two goals here. One is to develop this flex, flexible automated image analysis method that can work in different conditions, different locations. Um, and then the, the, the other question that we addressed in this paper are what are the effects of tides and currents on, on the UAV estimates of, of canopy area? So to, to, to address that tidal question, we conducted hourly flights at two different sites, one a Royal Camado near Santa Barbara, and then Honeymoon Cove, which is in Palos Verdes here um, in the South Bay. And so what we, we did was we, we went out during a tidal cycle and co conducted or collected an image every hour from high tide all the way all the way through low tide. We did this over the course of one day at Royal Camado and two separate days down at Honeymoon Cove. Um, to, to get at the effect of currents, then we went to, we conducted a multi-day survey at Arroyo Camado, where we, you know, for five days, we went during the same tidal stage. So, so each day we went an hour later about, um, to try to isolate the effects of tides so we can look at how currents might affect um, visible kelp canopy. And then, we, as part of this study, we, we conducted, we collected biweekly imagery at Honeymoon Cove around the same tidal stage from June 2018 to August 2019, just to demonstrate how we could look at, how we could use this to look at detailed seasonal variability in, in, in kelp abundance. <clears throat> and so part of the reason, I mean, one, one of, the, one of the reasons we did all these surveys was to, to examine the effects of tides and currents, but what it also gave us is a um, imagery from a wide variety of conditions, different seasons, different illumination conditions, um, different locations, so that we could really properly test this automated method, make sure it worked in a variety of conditions. Um, all this imagery was collected from a multi-spectral camera mounted to a um, DJI Matrice 100. And then to compare kelp canopy to tidal 
stage, we use tidal measurements from this NOAA tide station near Honeymoon Cove in Palos Verdes. At Arroyo Comado, we had ADCP measurements, so we were able to measure tides and, and, and currents there. And then just, just briefly, the multispectral sensor that we mount on our, on our, um, on our drone, again, has, is, is relatively inexpensive when you think about the sensors that are, that are up on a Landsat satellite. So there's, there's challenges with standardizing the data. We use a calibration panel with a known reflectance. Um, so we take an image of this calibration panel before each flight to correct for different illumination conditions and um, you know, cloudy versus sunny day, different times, times a day. Um, basically the way this works is we, we, we fly the drone over a lawnmower style pattern. We collect hundreds of images and then use structure from motion software to stitch them into one large ortho mosaic. Um, before that, we, we mask out the sun glint and waves using this gray level co-occurrence matri matrices, which are basically picks out contiguous areas of really high reflectance in the blue. Um, Kelp has a low reflectance in the blue. And so that's that's picking up these bright, bright sun glint and, and wave targets that you know help standardize the imagery. It also helps with that stitching to, to the ortho mosaic. Um, we resampled to 10 centimeter resolution and, and masked out the land, land in clouds. And so now we have this mosaic high resolution image of the of the study area and the you know the, the, the big challenge here is turning this into a map of kelp canopy in a fully automated automated fashion. And we we, we, we tested vegetation indices. So you know a common approach for satellite imagery analysis is to use these these vegetation indices that um, you know pick out photosynthetic vegetation, for example, from the from the background. And there's a wide variety of, of indices. We tested 20 different indices for their ability to separate kelp and water, and <clears throat> we categorized these indices into multispectral indices. So so indices that that use the the um, near infrared and, and and red edge spectral bands, and then RGB indices indices that just use red, green, and blue so that we could um, you know, see how well this would work with a less expensive, um, just a typical, typical, um, you know, an RGB, just a, a digital camera on a, on a, on a drone. <clears throat> and we found that, that for the multispectral in this, in, in the, the multispectral index that performed best was this normalized difference, red edge blue. It's kind of like an NDVI, but it uses red edge and blue in, instead of instead of near infrared and red. And um, that makes sense. Blue is very is again not reflected by kelp, but but you know reflected by the the, the water. And so this this differentiated the kelp kelp the best. And then amongst our RGB, our, you know, just our normal RGB metrics, just a simple red minus blue um, subtraction provided the best, best differentiation. So those, those um, you know, we, we identified kelp points and water points to test the, just the general ability to differentiate. The next step is to find the threshold. So what's the, so you have this, you converted the image into a, you know, a grayscale index, what's the threshold uh, above which you would you would call call the uh, pixel pixel kelp. Again, we run into the problem that the the radiometric corrections are not not great, um, and so we we found was that there was not a universal threshold that can be applied to different different images from different locations in different different time periods. We had to come up with some dynamic um, threshold detection, and so we used this you know, simply looked at the, the histogram of, of, of values in each image and noticed that, that in, in essentially all the image, there was two peaks. There was a, you know, a water peak and a, and a kelp peak. And we identified the midpoint between these peaks and found that that worked, worked very well as, as, a, as, as a threshold. So the absolute value of that threshold would, would change, but we could, we could identify it in an, in an automated um, fashion. Now, in certain instances, the image would be dominated by, by water, in which case we'd only see one, one peak, and then we used a function gradient to identify shoulders within the, the histogram um, and use the midpoint between the shoulder and the peak for, for that. And found that this worked very well with our, with our multispectral index, the normalized difference, red edge blue. We had an overall accuracy of 93%. 
again, randomly selecting 500 water and 500 kelp points from a variety of images. Um, <clears throat> the, the RGB, kind of the, the red blue index had a accuracy of 67%. What was happening here is that this was classifying submerged fronds in, as floating canopy in many cases. Um, you know, the, using the near infrared or the red edge, we're really just looking at the surface, whereas these, these RGB ind indices or RGB imagery can penetrate a little bit, a little bit more. Um, and so in some cases you might want to identify submerged fronds. And so, so RGB imagery can be useful for that. The, the, the challenge is, is that it's a, you know, it's just a little bit harder to standardize um, if you're, if you're collecting both submerged and canopy fronds, it's more sensitive to differences in water visibility and, and, and so on. <clears throat> so we created maps of kelp canopy using, using this method for all of our imagery and, and examine the effects of tides and currents. The figure on the left shows the um, relationship between canopy area and, and tidal height. Again, this is um, each one of these lines is a, is a day, you know, a, um, a day tidal survey. The, the blue and green lines with the steeper slopes are Honeymoon Cove, the two different days that we surveyed that. The yellow line with the shallower slope is Royal Kamado. And um, basically found that that for Honeymoon Cove, a meter increase in tidal height resulted in a, about 30% decrease in kelp canopy area. Um, whereas at Royal Kamado, that meter increase in tidal height resulted in about a 16% decrease in kelp canopy area. And so one thing that comes out is that there's not, you know, the effect of tides is going to vary by site, likely due to bed morphology, depth, um, the fraction of, of kelp that's in the canopy versus the water column. And so it, this is showing that, that tides are important. They, they certainly will bias canopy area estimates and, and that you know, if you want to create a tidal correction factor, you probably have to do this by, by site. Um, and so you know, I think what this, what this indicates for, for our satellite estimates is if possible, rather than try to create specific tidal correction factors, if you can, if you can average multiple observations to kind of smooth out the effect of tides and, and currents, that, that is ideal. Um, briefly, the figure on the right shows the impact of current speed on, on visible kelp canopy area. We see a, um, a marginal negative correlation with canopy area. This, this is a bit tough because we have very limited data size. And so we see a marginal p-value, but a pretty strong effect size. Um, actually, a really surprisingly strong correct effect size. We found that, that canopy area declined by about 32% for every 0.1 meter per second increase in current velocity, which seems seems strong to me, and and I think this indicates that we just we need more more data for to really get at the effect of current current speed. That seems a bit a bit um, strong. And then this is our our time series biweekly time series of of kelp canopy changes at Honeymoon Honeymoon Cove. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my see my cursor, but uh, there's just you know, some interesting phenological patterns. We see this canopy die off in um, July and August through September associated with high sea surface temperature. We think it's a canopy die off because as sea surface temperature declined, we saw a, you know, a, um, a brief recovery during, during November. And, and as I'll show in a second, that recovery kind of everything popped up together. Then we see this uh, canopy loss following these, the, the first big winter swells in December relatively low canopy through the spring and then, and then a recovery in, in April and March. And when we're thinking about spatial patterns in, in kelp dynamics, trying to look at that spatial small scale patterns in, in synchrony, you know, that's really where this, this, this data um, starts to, to have some, some interesting potential. And we haven't, we haven't conducted any, any proper spatial analysis, but I just wanted to kind of walk through, um, walk through give you a, a view of, 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 of what the data looks like. So you see that declines, canopy die off in the summer, relatively low canopy through October. Um, and then beginning of November, you see canopy kind of pop back up, especially in the deeper, deeper areas, um, you know, expanding, expanding to the, in, through, through December. And then during those first, during those first uh, winter swells, 
um, again, a loss of loss of canopy um, relatively low levels through the spring, and then some recovery that that you know starts in the shallow areas and then expands expands to depth. All right, really briefly, because I, I promised Tom that I'd give him a little bit a little bit more time. I just wanted to say that we've also developed a, an automated processing method for planet satellite imagery. This is exciting um, because it is it provides global coverage at this point every day, which is which is just incredible. Again, this is a commercial company that has a constellation of small, um, relatively in inexpensive multispectral sensors. And, and so the, the, the data quality is a little bit poor. So we have to do some, some processing to, to automate, automate that kelp extraction, but an order of magnitude higher resolution than Landsat so it can give us a better view of, of small sparse beds. And to the right is just a time series of kelp canopy around Palos Verdes from 2016 to 2019 um, that we created using, using planted imagery. And you know, I won't, I, I'll just, skip through this pretty pretty quickly. If you're interested in, in the processing, I think we've just nailed the, the automated processing with this with this data. I'm happy to talk in more detail um, myself or, or Kate can describe this. But essentially, we, we mask out the land and water, um, only use a higher quality pixels provided um, using this, this quality flag provided by planet, remove sun clouds and crashing waves using a similar approach to what we do with UAV data. Um, standardize the image. And then um, just we use this naive Bayes classifier to get the probability that each pixel is kelp. And we take advantage of the, you know, the daily imagery provided by planet to smooth out some of the noise. So for example, you know, the figure on the right does a pretty good job of, of picking up kelp, but you can see some of the misclassifications in the open, open ocean. Um, so we can take daily probabilities and then aggregate them into monthly probabilities to get a monthly time series. And that's what we've done so far. So we're, we're getting about five images per month, aggregating those daily probabilities to monthly um, probabilities, which, which filters out a lot of that, a lot of that noise, um, and then use a, a probability threshold on the monthly aggregate to get our binary classification. Again, now that we have daily data, we could probably do this on, on a weekly level. Um, you know, we could we could probably create a weekly time series that's overkill for now, and so we've just focused on on um, on monthly data monthly data for now. Most of our work so far has been in Northern California. This is especially useful for mapping small sparse bull kelp beds that are close to shore. Um, and there's a lot of interest in in the decline and the beginnings of the recovery of bull kelp populations in Northern California. So that's where most of this analysis has been conducted. We've compared our data to high resolution aerial surveys by California Department of Fish and Wildlife and found a strong matchup. Um, but, you know, this is just showing, showing how, how low kelp canopy in the North Coast is in 2020 as compared to, you know, the, the period before the, the big heat wave here. Um, but moving forward, we're going to expand this to Southern California, to Southern uh, Santa Barbara Channel, to our, to our LTR sites. I'm continuing the UAV time series of our L LTER core sites, which Tom is going to talk about in a moment here, and then start doing the, the analyses, right? D looking at drivers of recolonization on small scales um, and, and patterns of extinction, recolonization, synchrony, and so on. Okay, that's all I have. So, um, Kyle, while we're kind of switching over, Nick, um, had a quick question for you that he sent me um, about okay. using the, and I could probably answer this question since I'm an author on that paper too, but using that midpoint between, for, for the UAV imagery, using the midpoint between the, in the histograms versus mm -hmm. using the minimum point between the histograms. This probably is a question for Kate, but I don't know. If... Yeah, I, I think, I th to how how strict you want to be about surface versus you know slightly subsurface surface canopy um, mm -hmm. so I you know Kate Kate looked at a, a, a few different metrics and just and and you know part of this was just iterating through the, the the large amount of imagery that she had and she found that the midpoint midpoint worked best I think um, 
or was, was most reliable in a variety of conditions. I'm kind of speaking for her and so I can, I can double check with her to try to try or, or route that question to her. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Bob asked if, are we sure that the open ocean hits aren't kelp patties? We're, we're not sure. Um, I, you know, especially when we start working with three meter imagery, I suspect we will pick up kelp patties. I think there's a question of whether we, whether we want to or not. I mean, that seems to me like a, a slightly different data set. Um, it, it, you know, using this, this kind of daily aggregation to try to get a, a monthly picture of kelp canopy is it would not be the best method for for detecting patties and so we might you know I, I would almost suggest trying to come up with a separate way to identify patties if that was that was something we wanted to look like I don't know what your thoughts are on that Tom um yeah so I mean I think in that specific example some of the offshore uh classified pixels look fairly linear which to me yeah. kind of screams you know imagery problems um, or just you know like like glint on the on you know the back side or front side of waves and so yeah on. yeah um or where you stitch imagery together mm -hmm, um mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think that kelp patties are something we've been interested in for a while looking at because you see them even in landsat sometimes especially after large wave events and they make interesting patterns offshore um yeah it was, it's something we can think about but i was just curious about that i think yeah it would be a different effort but Ras has a question about the water current stuff. I, I had a question, Kyle, and I, I may have missed some, you know, pieces in between, but um, the sort of canopy results were originally uh, like ground truth to data from our monthly monitoring sites, right? Like to the amount of, like the way we got to kilograms of kelp, mm -hmm. right? And I can see how the Tidal results here would average out if you had enough data in a location from different tides, right? But you have really big differences in currents, and I'm guessing that's really different from site to site. So I'm just wondering, what do you, I mean, I, I've always sort of wondered, uh, you know, how much is all this sensitive to differences in depth and stuff, but certainly you just showed, like, if we try to take the the ground truth relationships and apply them to locations that have consistently different or just different average currents. It, am I correct in interpreting this that we might be wrong by a factor of you know 30% or something in terms of the estimates of kilograms of kelp? Yeah, I think I, I you know you're so you're saying this this is a site that that on average has is more currents and so there's it's likely that on average it's pulling down pull, pulling down um some of the canopy compared to this other site and even even if we're averaging multiple observations within a season if it's just a a a high current site then then we're still still kind of underestimating underestimating canopy is that what, yeah like that what like saying? kamado kamado swung from one hour to or from one day to the next over your couple you know five Kamado swung by, uh, I don't know, 30 or 40% there, right? And so presumably if you went down and applied this relationship in Belito or farther down the coast and currents were, you know, consistently, not consistently, but just on average 25% higher or 10% higher. I don't, I don't know what the scales mm -hmm. are. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if you've thought about the scales and what that might mean for applying the same relationship everywhere. I'm sorry about the Legos in the background. No, no, no worries. No, I think, you know, a lot of what we've done with Landsat data is looking at changes through time. So kind of like relative changes, but, and so I've always cautioned people, like if, if when we're, when we're thinking about trying to make absolute quantification of canopy biomass, I think what, I think what you're saying is, 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 is valid. And so, you know, some sites there might be a um, underestimate in, in absolute biomass. I think at that site, when you look at changes through, through time, I, I, I think that, that, um, you know, you're still, we're, we're, we're capturing the variability through time, but I think what you say is, is, is reasonable for thinking about absolute absolute differences across across sites. And I and there is, you know, yeah, yeah. I think Dan Dan uh, has a question. Uh, yeah, um, I was just curious. The tidal effects that you attributed to site might easily 
be attributed to seasonality as well. The, right. The Kamado stuff was done in January and the honeymoon in July. And just, you know, at times when there's not much and frond lengths at the surface are really small, you're not going to see much effect with the canopy. But in July, when they're really large, you're going to see huge swings. And so um, it may not be so much you have to characterize every site as much as you have to characterize seasonality and changes in surface canopy length, say. Yeah, that's a good point. Good point. Um, I think, I think that sure. gets to what to Jen's question too here in the chat. Well, Cal says hi. Hey. Well, hello. Um, real quick, how do I make someone else to host? Or you can just maybe enable screen sharing. All right, give me a second. Okay, you should be able to share the screen, Tom. All right. Is everybody seeing that? Okay, cool. Are you ready for me to go? Are we still doing questions? I think so. I think I mean your 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 work is or what you're going to present is pretty related. So so we yeah. could we could continue the questions after you you finish yours. Cool. It sounds good to me. And um, apologies if internet goes out, but so again, um, we're going to kind of skip through the stuff that Kyle covered a little bit, but um, it's theme three A and um, you know a lot of our previous work on synchrony dealt with kelp at a regional scale, right? So you can see this in Max's papers, um, Kyle's 2013 synchrony paper, where we looked at kind of one kilometer chunks of coastline and summed all the kelp biomass um, within those one kilometer chunks um, or patches, which kind of end up being more or less one kilometer chunks of coastline. Um, and you saw these colonization and extinction relationships that Kyle showed in his talk. Um, but for the SBC LTR4, we really wanted to examine small scale extinction events and relate these local patterns of recolonization to, to connectivity and environmental factors, right? And we decided to do one of the ways to do this outside of you know, using higher resolution satellite imagery with like planet is to look at these very small scale changes using drones. And drones um, have kind of jumped into the forefront over the last few years. Luckily, um, you know, the LTR has been kind of an early adopter of drones for site level analysis. And so this is a early drone image I think we took of the Carpentaria kelp forest back in maybe 2016 or 2017. You can see the spatial resolution that you can get um, where you can cover easily areas of, you know, on scales of hundreds of meters to a couple kilometers, um, but still maintain that resolution to get down to centimeter scale. So here we're in the inset, you're seeing individual fronds. We probably don't want to get, you know, to do analyses on these um, centimeter, exact centimeter pixels through time because kelp canopy is going to change by meters um, depending on the, on the current, um, but we'll definitely utilize those We'll definitely utilize those scales to um, examine kelp through time. Am I back? I think my internet dropped out. You're looking good, Tom. Okay, good. Okay, so <clears throat> even from looking at the Landsat imagery, um, which again is at a 30 meter pixel scale, we can see these kind of local pattern, local dynamics. And so this is a paper that Dave and I have been working on for quite a while, um, but we'll be going out to review hopefully soon. Um, and so here is just an example from the Western side of Santa Rosa Island. I think this was in 2003. Um, and I wanted to point out how seasonality and kelp may affect these local dynamics. And so if you look at spring, which is in um, figure C here, this is the kelp canopy we observed in spring. And D is the kelp canopy we observed in summer with that outlined area in red representing the area we saw in spring. Um, in fall, you can see there was an overall decrease in canopy biomass, 
but that the decrease was greater in the area that we saw in spring. And then by winter, uh, the amount of the canopy that was left was the was the canopy that grew during summer. And we had lost pretty much all the canopy that, um, that was first established in spring. And if you look at those two uh, time series of kelp canopy biomass and the two red lines in B, uh, you can see that the solid red line represents the canopy that was formed in spring. Um, and we saw later regrowth in the dashed red line, which is the canopy we observed in summer. And that canopy that we observed in summer tended to last longer uh, into the year. And one of the reasons for this, we think, is senescence. And so Gabe Rodriguez and others at the LTER had looked at the effect of kelp canopy senescence previously. Um, and we wanted to look at this on a, on a kind of two-dimensional spatial scale through time. And so for this, we use the Avaris uh, uh, aerial spectrometer. So this is on, this was on a aircraft that flies at 60,000 feet. Um, and this is an example of the kelp forest, of a kelp forest out by Point Conception, the, or other, otherwise known as the Coho kelp forest um, throughout the spring and summer of 2015. Um, we saw very high, Re, uh, growth. And if you look down at the bottom row here, this is biomass again in this kind of green to yellow color. We saw growth in the spring um, with a very young canopy age because it was all new growth. And one thing we can get from the hyperspectral sensor on Avaris is an estimate of physiological conditions. So this is the amount of chlorophyll pigment that is in the canopy, in the kelp canopy. And what we saw in April uh, when the canopy first grew was a very high canopy chlorophyll signature, which we call can uh, chlorophyll to carbon ratio. Um, in June, a few months later, we saw more canopy development, but this area that first grew in April tended to have lower canopy chlorophyll to carbon ratio than the new growth areas. And that was related to canopy age. And so we estimated canopy age based on our time series of Landsat. So when we first saw a canopy pop, a canopy pixel um, pop up, we gave it an age of one, and then we counted the days um, through time that we observed that pixel. And so we tended to see older canopy where we first saw the canopy appear in April. By August, uh, we saw a complete loss of this canopy in the middle, right? Which had these lower chlorophyll to carbon ratios in, uh, in June and we did not see a loss, at least in August, of this canopy, which grew, um, which we saw grow between April and June. Right. So this is a, this is some evidence that the senescence patterns, and we would expect that the chlorophyll content decreases as um, blades age, and we know that from going out in, into the field. When you look at older kelp blades, they tend to be lighter in color, have less pigment. Um, before they're naturally released from the kelp from the kelp plant, and so this gave us some uh, more ideas about how to examine these local patterns of growth and loss um, within kelp forests using using drones. Um, and as Kyle said, you know drones are a great way to look at the, look at the kelp on a site site level scale um, at very high spatial resolution. And so this is on the left is Jordan Snyder who is a technician um, and will be starting her PhD work at uh, UCSB in fall. And then there's Kyle with the Matrice 100 that he talked about in his talk. And these are both at the Arroyo Kamado site or launching area from the Arroyo Kamado site. Um, through a Department of Energy project we've been working on, we've been able to develop new techniques for examining um, canopy area, canopy biomass, and canopy physiological condition using different types of sensors on drones um, and how to compare that back to satellite measure or satellite estimates of biomass using Landsat. And so I'm gonna go through these um, kind of one at a time. And so 
we first wanted to look at canopy area. And so this is analogous to what Kyle presented and uh, the information that was in Kate's paper. So this is using uh, color cameras or color digital cameras on drones. These are very cheap, um, inexpensive. Uh, you can get a very high quality uh, color camera on a drone, um, usually like a DJI Phantom 4 Pro for something around $1,500. We've used a few of these in our time series so far. And this is actually what's built the bulk of our site level time series at the LTER sites, because we've been doing this the longest. Um, and like Kyle said, um, from Kate's paper, we have these color um, kind of indices where we use the red minus blue bands to separate the canopy, floating canopy area from uh, the surrounding seawater. And so we can very easily and quickly take these orthomosaic flights um, and images of these sites and get estimates of canopy area. And so, for example, this is a June 30th, 2018 image or 19 image of the Royal Kama of part of the Royal Kamado kelp forest. Um, and then this is the classified canopy area we get using that red minus, minus blue. And this is our time series of the Aurora Kamado kelp forest using color imagery um, so far. So this ranges back through late 2017 when we first started doing this all the way through last week. So um, this uh, bottom right ortho mosaic is last Thursday. So this um, time series to go out and get an image um, is fairly quick. We usually go out around 1030 to 11 o'clock a.m. Um, on days when we had a Landsat overpass so we can so we can compare the canopy area that was captured by the drones to canopy area that is captured by um, Landsat so we get simultaneous imagery um, and I'm working with Lee right now to put all of these data onto the LTR server. And so we'll have both the color imagery that we collect, which you see here, as well as the classified canopy area. Um, and I think we'll be degrading these down to about a 10 centimeter um, spatial resolution. So each pixel represent a 10 by 10 centimeter, 10 centimeter area. Um, another way we can look at kelp canopy is using multispectral sensors. And so this is really analogous to the Landsat time series we have been developing over the past few years. And the LTER has a drone with a multispectral sensor on it. Um, you can see on the left here, this is the, Mic this is the Micasense Altum sensor. So this has five spectral bands in the blue, the green, the red, the red edge, and the near infrared, as well as a thermal camera. And so every time we send this, we send this sensor um, up over a, a site, either Mohawk or uh, Kamado, and collect imagery, we get simultaneous reflectance of all of these bands, um, which we can use using uh, which we can use to estimate canopy density and canopy biomass using the same methods we develop for Landsat. Um, Again, we calibrate all of these measurements using a standardized reflectance plaque at the beginning of each flight. And then this uh, figure here kind of shows the spectral bands that are collected by the sensor. So here we have a blue, a green, a red band. We have one additional band called the red edge, which is right at the edge of the red as you measure red reflectance to near infrared reflectance and near infrared, which we cannot see with our eyes, but floating kelp canopy uh, produces a high near infrared reflectance, um, much, much higher than seawater. So it can be used to, to, um, to differentiate uh, floating kelp canopy from seawater. And so this is an example of a segment of the Aurora Kamado kelp forest. Uh, this is a color image collected by the multispectral sensor on a uh, DJI Matrice 200. And so this is the exact drone that um, is owned by the LTER, which we've been doing some of our surveys with. 
Um, and for those of you that are familiar with the Aroa Kamado site, this is uh, the sand channel um, kind of that separates the two chunks of the forest to, apart. And you can see this creek that runs through the houses here over the beach um, and then into the ocean uh, right where the sand channel is. And we can use the we can use the um, reflectance information to, to estimate canopy density and canopy biomass, which we see here uh, in the shades of green. Kind of, so lighter shades of green represent um, less dense canopy and darker shades of green represent um, uh, more dense canopy. And then the red, white to blue, of the brightness temperature or, temperature or the sea surface temperature of the water around the kelp forest. And what was interesting about this day is because this was a few days after a rain event, we had um, water coming out over the beach through that creek. Um, and you can see that freshwater lens, which extended into the ocean over, through the breakers um, and actually became trapped in some of the in some of the uh, floating kelp forest canopy. And so the multispectral imagery is analogous to the satellite imagery we've been talking about or we've been using for years. Um, but one advantage it gives us is that we can observe dynamics in sparse canopy, which are missed by the 30 meter scale Landsat imagery. And so, um, Back in June of 2019, as part of this um, paper we put together, we flew um, all three of our drones um, simultaneous to a Landsat 7 overpass. So we, were, we could directly compare the amount of, of biomass to, uh, that, we, that we, sorry, the amount of biomass we observed from the multispectral imagery to um, the amount of biomass we captured from, we estimated from Landsat. And what is interesting is that while the, pat the general patterns of biomass collected or estimated from the two sensors um, generally agree, there are um, entire areas where the, drone where the drone observes kelp canopy, but Landsat doesn't. And so this, these are these sparse canopy areas that are particularly important for looking at kelp um, patch extinction and recolonization. So Landsat would miss these pixels completely because the canopy was too sparse. If we assumed that when Landsat sees nothing, the kelp patch is extinct, um, we might uh, interpret a recolonization of a patch when there had been kelp there the whole time. And so this is one of the important reasons we're using these higher spatial scale imagery to look at canopy dynamics at the LTR core sites. Um, and one other important thing we really want to examine, especially in light of what we saw with the hyperspectral imagery from Avaris and how canopy senescence is important to um, canopy dynamics is we wanted to examine how is the condition or the quality of the kelp canopy changing through time. And so this is a drone image of a small section of Aroa Kamado. And you can see these differences in frond color at the, at the canopy where you have these ranging anywhere from kind of dark fronds, which may represent fronds with more chlorophyll pigment um, to these very light, almost whitish fronds um, which rep may represent area uh, fronds with lower chlorophyll content. And the main difference between hyperspectral and multispectral imagery is that we get much more, many more bands, so much more spectral information from a hyperspectral image than a multispectral image. So while we may get four or five bands, spectral bands, from this um, Microsense Altum sensor, we've been using this head wall. Um, hyperspectral scanner to get uh, 270 contiguous spectral bands. So we get a re reflectance, uh, a contiguous reflectance spectrum for each pixel. Um, and we also wanted to verify whether or not 
what we're seeing with the imagery is actually what's happening in uh, reality at these sites. So we've also um, initiated experiments where we've gone out to Mohawk and Aroa Kamado and tagged fronds through time. So we go out every two weeks, we tag fronds, um, and we can follow those fronds through time. So we know exactly when the frond um, uh, was first tagged. We have a growing frond about two meters back from the growing tip. Um, and we can go back to those fronds every two weeks, sample the blade at the point of the tag um, to track how, can how canopy chlorophyll uh, concentrations change um, as the fronds age. And what we found is that there's this predictable decrease in chlorophyll concentration in the kelp tissue through time. And so these just represent five cohorts from the Mohawk kelp forest we looked at um, from April through August of 2019. Um, and when we standardize the amount of chlorophyll to the original chlorophyll that we, that we uh, found in each frond, and kind of standardize for the amount, for the differences in environmental conditions through time, we see a very predictable decrease as we move from a mature, um, high chlorophyll concentration blade to a more senescent, low chlorophyll concentration blade. And we know that kelp reflectance uh, is affected by changes in many photosynthetic pigments related to growth and age. And so I just want to show you this for as an example. The two purple lines represent kelp uh, blade reflectance measured in the lab um, at different points, um, at basically different physiological states. So this purple line with the higher overall reflectance represents a lighter uh, blade with less chlorophyll. And you can see this kind of wiggles and curves in these kelp reflectance spectra. And these uh, changes in reflectance are, are driven by the absorption of light of different, of different photosynthetic pigments. And so kelp has chlorophyll A, which you can see in this blue line, chlorophyll C, which you can see in this green line, and fucoxanthin, which you can see in this kind of yellowish orange line. Um, importantly, kelp lacks chlorophyll B, which is um, present in almost all terrestrial vegetation, which is in this dashed red line. And so you can map um, these changes in reflectance to where these pigments absorb on the electromagnetic spectrum. So chlorophyll A absorbs very highly here around 668 in the red portion of the light. And so that is going to drive this dec decrease in reflection here. Um, chlorophyll C, can see absorbs here around 640. And so that um, uh, leads to this decrease in reflectance here and here. Um, and then fucoxanthin and chlorophyll A and chlorophyll C all absorb in the blue. And that's why we have very low reflectance in the blue, which aids us with our um, glint masking, which Kyle, which Kyle talked about earlier. And we can use these changes in different pigments or the absence of pigments like chlorophyll B to our advantage to estimate physiological condition of the canopy um, with spectral imagery. And so we're able to do this um, using a long time series of blade me uh, reflectance measurements in the lab, as well as chlorophyll and nitrogen content um, measurements to derive a spectral algorithm for nitrogen content of the canopy and apply that to our hyperspectral imagery. And uh, there's actually been a recent advancements in drone sensor technology, which make our task easier. So to operate that hyperspectral scanner is pretty difficult. Um, it's hard to geo-reference all the scan lines into a single image. Luckily, uh, we now have access to a 10 band um, sensor, multispectral sensor, which can be operated just like our existing five band sensor. And we have this in-house now. Um, so we did some tests where we went out and collected uh, kelp blades um, and measured reflectance in the field. And, and uh, when we took them back to shore, and then we were able to borrow one of these sensors to take pictures of the kelp blades. And we found that um, using these 10 bands, we can accurately uh, uh, measure the reflectance 
of the kelp blade and we compared it to a handheld spectrometer, which we have. Um, and what's important is those reflectances matched up very well in the areas that matter to us. And so especially this red band and this orange band here. So we can theoretically get to um, physiological condition, chlorophyll content and senescence. And so uh, in the future, uh, Jordan Snyder, who I talked about before, is going to be using this 10 band sensor to um, track the canopy physiological condition and simultaneous biomass of these sites using um, this new sensor. And so we just did our first flight last week um, at Arroyo Camado. And so this is just, this is kind of hot off the press. This is a portion of the Arroyo Camado kelp forest. Lighter colors here represent um, higher near infrared reflectance. So this would be more biomass. And this is a, at about an eight centimeter spatial scale. And then I just selected three different spectra, uh, three different pixels where we have the individual spectra. And so we can use these two bands in the red and the orange to get to physiological condition. And why that's important to looking at changes to localize extinction and um, colonization patterns is we can better track why the why we're losing canopy in certain areas. So we already have as we already know why we lose, you know, canopy due to waves. Um, but this would give us a better understanding of where kelp is, how it's changed through time, um, and the and how the environment, like the amount of nutrients, is related to the amount of chlorophyll in the pigment across and the chlorophyll in the tissue across the entire site and where we might expect to lose uh, canopy and, um, and then track how it recovers the next season. And then one other thing I wanted to talk about before I finish is that there's another grad student um, with Dave Siegel, um, Natalie Eagholm, who is developing a model of uh, mechanistic model of kelp um, dispersal and growth and senescence. And right now she's working uh, at kind of using Mohawk kelp forest as a, as a focal site, um, but she is basically incorporating time series of nitrate, time series of PAR um, and waves uh, and different variables such as number of plants and tracking the growth of plants, the growth of fronds, the senescence of fronds, and also spore production and how those um, disperse across space. So we'll have kind of a model to kind of understand how uh, kelp should disperse um, across space following large removal events or an extinction and colonization. Um, and as of right now, her preliminary model is producing the same proportions of subsurface um, water column and canopy biomass as some of the longer uh, SBC LTR time series data. And that's it, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Tom. Sure. And Kyle, really interesting. Um, we've got only a couple minutes left for questions. Uh, and those who want could stay on longer if, if you have time, but uh, let's see, are there any questions in the chat? Who has a question? Oh, looks like Clint has a question. Hey, uh, Kyle and uh, Tom, I had a question. I know we touched on this in the past, but have you guys uh, made any refinements on how you deal with epiphyte cover of the canopy um, using the multi-spectral multi imagery? So we have, you know, taken some of the blades into the lab and and actually use the handheld spectrometer to look at how changes in um, bryozoan cover changes the reflectance spectrum. Um, we have seen some evidence that it does, you know, for one, increase the overall reflectance, but to uh, change the reflectance a bit in the blue, um, there's a possibility that we could either spectrally look at cover of bryozoans or use um, other classification techniques on the color imagery, but it's something that 
I think is pretty interesting, but nothing, nothing concrete yet. Cool. One other quick question, if I could. Um, also, you guys say you can tell submerged from surface. Are you using a comparison of the two different types of imagery, like the RGB compared to the other, or are you sort of manually figuring that out, um, looking at the images? So far, what, what I've done is just kind of manually looking at it. And again, it really depends on kind of visibility and, and, and so on. So I haven't, we haven't kind of, we haven't done a, I guess a quantification or a, um, yeah, an automated, at least we have, you know, Kate and I haven't tried to automate, automate that. I don't know, Tom, if you have. Well, that is, that is a good point, Clint, about kind of looking at, you know, different spectral indices. So when we have the multispectral imagery, we get all the color bands as well. So we could easily, easily isolate floating canopy using the red edge and the near infrared bands or the near infrared indices that Kate made, right? And then depending on the water clarity, you know, try to see what's left and how well um, or how accurate what's left is actually submerged canopy or whether it's, if it's, very error prone, but that's that's a good way to look at it and go forward. Yeah, I think this could be really interesting at like Mohawk or um, Naples, where there's much higher currents than that 0.1 meter that you get at Royal Kamado, um, and you'll get better water clarity there too to be able to kind of look at the differences, how the uh, how the uh, canopy is just kind of sitting down. Yeah, day. yeah, yeah. I mean, we've had days at Royal Kamado when the water is extremely clear like his back like your background like my background yep <laughs> and that gets that gets to max's question on on clear days yeah we can get surf grass grigia um you know we, we i'm part of another project where we're mapping uh rock weed and so you know go out in very low low tides and and um you know it's it, there's a lot you can a lot of different species you can detect um you know, in that intertidal zone on extreme low tides. But, but it depends, it, it, like the, the kind of submerged, submerged stuff depends on, on conditions, water clarity and so on. But the, the nice thing with the drones is that we have control over that. And so if it could be something where if there's, you know, monitor the situation, if there's opportunities, we could go out um, at, at certain, certain sites and, and collect that. Uh. Tom, I was just wondering, so what's the status of the of the surveys and how we're gonna keep doing those once you are gone, et cetera? Is that all is that all kind of worked out now or is there stuff that we need to do? Well, the surveys, um, you know, I think that incorporating the new sensors into the surveys would be beneficial. So we just you know, went out last Thursday, flew our first flights with the, with the dual sensor system, the 10 band. Um, so Jordan is all trained up to do that. She can fly all the drones. Um, Stuart um, is also getting trained up. Natalie has her license. Um, it'd be great to get, bring on more people, um, unfortunately. The past year has been difficult for getting for <laughs> interacting with people and getting everybody trained up. Um, but I think, you know, at the present time, Jordan's fully trained to continue these surveys as we go forward. Um, and we great. have some we have some drone kind of uh, cheat sheets and and um, guides to get everything up to speed. Yeah, I mean, I think I think last year we talked about having a, a, a course over the summer, which obviously got sidetracked. But when things get back to normal, I think we should definitely more people, more students and techs mm -hmm. that are trained, the better. But I think for now, Jordan, Jordan is the is the future. And, um, you know, you know, my students and and techs can come up if for like a monthly survey. I, we can we can help out, too. Now, um, are those are those surveys being done at the same time every month? And are, is there a pipeline for the, for the data at this point? Or are those there's, things? there's code for the data um, and kind of an analysis pipeline. Uh, they're not being done at the same time every month. I mean, 
before before COVID, I mean, anytime anytime there's like a stay at home order, we can't fly, right? So we couldn't fly over the past two months, um, no matter if we were alone. Right. So uh, we're living it on when we can go out. Um, we, if there's a schedule, you know, we've been prioritizing our flights um, as often as we can to match them up with Landsat data. And generally that, you know, ends up being like a monthly flight at these sites. Um, we have, we have locations where we launch from for both Mohawk and Royal Kamado. I think those would be the two sites to focus on in the future um, because access is pretty easy. Um, Carpentria is another one that's possible, but it does require launching from the marsh. Um, Naples sounds like, unless you're doing it from a boat, would be pretty much impossible. But the color imagery is easy to get from a boat. Um, the larger drones, I would say, are possible, but it would be it would take a little bit more work. I'm surprised that they won't let you go out by yourself. Or uh, is that a UCSB rule? Or well, there's like the UC Drone Safety Office. I mean, they don't want you if oh. there's a stay-at-home order. They don't want you going out of your house, right? So, like, it's not just flying by yourself. It's as has been explained to me. It's me getting in my car, going to get gas, that's an opportunity for me to get COVID or me to spread COVID, right? And I mean, I agree. If it's stay at home, we shouldn't be leaving home. Yeah, that's interesting. But yeah, we, I mean, Tom, Tom brings around. up a good point. Oh. We, every, all of this gets approved for, through the UC drone office, which is important because they provide insurance, both liability and actually now they cover our, our equipment. So, so kind of we're just following, following their approval rules. Right. Okay. I see. So they're more strict than the university as a whole then because we're going out in the boats and stuff like that. That's the sense uh, that I get. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had to do a drone. We had to do a COVID safety plan for the drones as well, which is all, you know, done. And we got, we got going pretty quickly again, once everything's, once everything hit, but um, yeah, Brandon who runs the drone safety office is actually really easy to work with. Um, and we have projects set up for these that are ongoing. So to get a approval for a flight is almost automatic. Cool. All right, well, are there any other questions for Tom and Kyle at this point? Uh, Bob, I just uh, wanted to add that we can apply for an exemption, Brandon, Bob? if we apply to UC Office of Research. Uh, okay. Uh, sorry, was that, was that Dave? Yeah. Dave, David, uh, and then Dave Siegel. Who, um, Dave Siegel, did you have a question? I think I froze. We can hear you. Gotcha. Oh yeah, hi, hi. It's it's uh it's Dave Siegel. Just um, uh, just a quick comment. I mean, the the well, the drones are going to be super useful for understanding process on small scales, but we you know, and to get that understanding so we can scale it up. To larger scales, but we're going to have, if we're going to do anything that's going to be, you know, channel wide or even coastline wide, we're, we're going to need satellite data. So either data like the, uh, li uh, like the planet imagery that, that, um, that Kyle showed earlier, or, you know, there's going to be a hyperspectral satellite soon enough. The, um, the, uh, whatever the heck it's called, RGB, no. <laughs> that's, that's SDG. <laughs> I can never remember. I always get a, get, get a mixed up with, with Ruth Ginsburg. Um, <laughs> but, you know, so, so you know, I, I, I think that having a time series is important for understanding things, but I don't at those two sites, but I wouldn't, you know, make, make more, at, think that we can do more than that. It's just by, I, I, yeah, I agree. I mean, it is a lot of work to, it's still, it's time consuming to collect the data to process it. And so I, totally agree Dave like I think this is maybe a site level data set but it's in no way 
know, it's limited and it, it's going to be limited in the spatial extent. I think that's a great, a great point. Um, and I think like, I, I think there's some exciting things we could do with data fusion between something like mm -hmm. Planet and SVG and Landsat and, and, and so on. And so that's still for, for the kind of, a lot of the questions we want to address, that's still our bread and butter. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, especially, it, it, especially like intercalibrating all the, all the crappy sensors. I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, you were pretty clear that, well, that once we went from using spot data to Landsat data, you were very happy because you had a, time series is all regular, is all done the same way. There was no nonsense. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like we're going back to that. So I'm just a little, you know. <laughs> There's more nonsense now, yes. Yeah. Well, at the site level, um, it seems like, you know, once the surveys are being done again regularly, we could be collecting um, across site data on recruitment, um, bathymetry, and other factors that might be, you know, linked to that fluctuation at, at the at, at the site scale and it might be worth talking about what scale those would be needed um, to to be collected at you know like across transects going into the bed for example um, etc to look at what what the drivers are with with insight of canopy emergence and senescence Uh, any comment on that or is, is that worth doing? Am I frozen? No, 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 no. I, I, I was muted and I was talking. Um, I think that the, um, the, you know, knowing the details, uh, I mean, I'm thinking for the modeling that, uh, well, that Natalie's starting, having some better sense of the details of what is the bathymetry um, and the, you know, what, what is the potential sites that what, what, what that would make some, 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 some sense at those core sites would really help. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, something about cover and some sense about how that might be changing, you know, how, how the benthic types might be changing would be, would be super important, super useful for, uh, well, for that. I don't know how to do all that, but. You know, and you know, and, well, and, and and we have a lot to learn just to just to see how much how much are the changes that we're seeing in the canopy are really changes that we're seeing in the entire plant structure. Right. Well, that could be something. I need, Billy is interested in similar things, Billy Beckley, and it could be something that they collaborate on potentially. Uh, I think it would just require some um, a few months, perhaps of data collection um, at the two sites. We could come up with a plan to do that. Yeah, so we have that the time series that I showed for Kamado and we have a similar time series for Mohawk. Um, we have more imagery at Kamado just because we've been focused on that for other projects, our DOE project too. Um, but we have a pretty uh, you know consistent ongoing time series there that Right. I'm working with Leon to get on the, so on for the... like unchanging things like bathymetry mm -hmm. that could all be used. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions today? All righty. Looks like we lost most most people. <laughs> <laughs> We lost him about thirty minutes ago. Um, one thing, Clint, Clint uh, I was one. one yeah, one. Thing, um, I think there's a tidbit on the surface at both of those sites. I don't know if that would be useful to data to calibrate the um, the thermal. Yeah, yeah that's, that was a question I had. Like that, that we could. Yeah, I'm curious about how how yeah how accurate the thermal is, and doing some calibration would be would I be think great. The problem I, I, might be that the tidbit is like a little bit below the surface, and so what's the difference between that very skin on the surface? We're just yeah, yeah thinking about other ways that we could calibrate that. As I have, I have to run, I have a I have another. Yeah, uh, Kyle, Kyle, yep. that's a yep. it's a single single infrared channel temperature, okay. it's a brightness temperature. The contrast that Tom was showing is shows up to be about five degrees across that, which seems okay. a little large. Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, yeah. it, was, it, it was showing it was showing like the flood waters coming in were 16 degrees, the offshore waters were like 12 mm -hmm. or 11. So it seemed pretty big. So I, you know, I think we could see that. I, you know, it's it might be good for seeing contrast, but you know, there's it's it's not an accurate measurement of sea surface temperature. Got it. Thank you. See ya. See ya. All right. Bye, everyone. You know, put up. Good to see you guys. See you next week. Hey, Tom, just a quick one. If yeah. there's anything else.